So uh, we want to welcome um, Bob today as our guest speaker, but Bob is um, what's called a charter member here. So he helped to start Unity Spiritual Center of the Mojave Valley. Um, 23 years ago. Oh my God. Yeah. And he's been deeply, deeply involved uh, at the level of the board and with the prayer ministry. He helps out in so many ways. I, I, you know, and you know, when you go to do the list, it goes blank. But just know we, we cherish this man and so honored that he will share with us today. Bob O'Keefe. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's uh, nice to be up here. I, I've given, in the course of 43 years, maybe two or three of these uh, talks. And, uh, and so I'm glad to be giving one again today. And I was there at the first meeting uh, of Unity 23 years ago. Uh, I'm old. <laughs> yeah, uh, so thank you for inviting me to do this. I appreciate it. Uh, Natalie, I do have one request of you. Please, please. If Barry starts snoring in the middle of my talk loudly, please just elbow him. That was so embarrassing last time. <laughs> When I come here, I, I usually sit as far in the back as I can. I'm very talking behind somebody, you know. So when I nod off, I'm hoping Barry doesn't notice. <laughs> well, uh, I talked with my brother last week. We had a great talk uh, until the very end. But I hung up on him. But, uh, but it was a good talk. He called from prison. And uh, the last thing he said was, uh, you know how people used to say that we would complete each other's sentences? <laughs> That's when I hung up. <laughs> Actually, we did talk last week. Uh, he, he was not in prison. Uh, and we had a great talk. We get along pretty well today. Uh, ever since he left home and got married, we've really done very well together. Uh, when I was 18 years old, he asked me to be his best man at his wedding, and I was overjoyed to do that. Because he was leaving. <laughs> but in honor of my brother and uh, our relationship, I'm dedicating my talk today to uh, uh, a couple of uh, stories from uh, <clears throat> religious traditions. I was able to travel when I was younger a lot, and I got exposed to uh, uh, religious traditions of the Quran and the Upanishads from the uh, Hindus and the Sutras from the Buddhas. And today I've chosen uh, one of the most bizarre uh, traditions of them all, but the Bible. <laughs> and I'm dedicating my talk today to a couple of uh, other stories from the Bible. But first, I have a few brother-themed jokes. And I hope no one brought any tomatoes, because they're not all that great, sort of like dad jokes, you know. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. My brother and I laugh at how competitive we were as kids, but I laughed a lot more. <laughs> My brother wanted to be an archaeologist, but ten years later his career lies in ruins. <laughs> when I was a young man in my twenties, my mom called to me to ask me to hand out invitations to a surprise birthday party. She's been spending a lot of time planning for my brother. That's when I realized 
he was her favorite twin. <laughs> <laughs> when I had a, when I was a child, I had a condition that I had to eat mud three times a day in order to survive. I'm really lucky that my brother told me all about that. <laughs> How many brothers do robots have? None. But they do have trans sisters. <laughs> my brother threw my favorite lamp at me. I'm not sure I'll be able to look at him in the same light again. <laughs> and that actually brings me to the core of the talk. Yes, we got along well after we left home. <clears throat> he was uh, my closest uh, in age brother, he's five years older than I am. Altogether, I have seven brothers and sisters. I'm the baby of the family. And I think I've heard someone around here sometime, I, I overheard them talking about me, and, and they said something like, I act like a 77-year-old baby. You well, know? it comes natural, it comes natural. <coughs> Many years ago, I, I wasn't 77, I was 11, and Pat, my brother, was 16. Now, I saw him as a bully, and he really was. He saw me as an incredible annoyance, and I really was. I see that now as an adult looking back, how I could be really annoying. But at the time, I saw myself as a victim of his constant aggravation. At any rate, on this one occasion, in the kitchen doing chores, doing the dishes, he was all over me. And I don't remember what incident started it or whatever. He was all over me, demeaning me, threatening me, and I had had enough. And at the time, I was drying dishes, and the dish in my hand happened to be a heavy, old-fashioned iron frying pan. And I threw at him, threw it at him quite hard. And he was in close range. Um, but he ducked just in the nick of time. And for that split second, I could have killed him. My anger and my rage overtook me. The ego ruled. So when I think of the story of Cain and Abel, unfortunately, I guess I have to identify with Cain. <laughs> wow. That's sober. But I take comfort in the metaphysical interpretation of the story. <clears throat> Cain and Abel can be seen as part of our two different natures within each one of us. One is physical and of this world, and the other is spiritual. And there, of course, is a struggle with the incompatibility of these two natures, especially when the ego is in control. In ancient Hebrew, Cain means getting from the earth and from the senses carnal creations representing our lower selves. And Cain did work the earth. He was a farmer. Abel, on the other hand, means breath in the original Hebrew and represents our spiritual nature. And these are both present in each of us. Abel was a shepherd which was a more spiritual calling than a farmer, at least in those days. He watched over and cared for his flock, rather than making something from the earth. Now remember, this is a mythological story. There's only about six people on earth at this time, plus God. And uh, so it's very intimate. <laughs> By the way, God is still very intimate within each of us. But then, 
he had so many fewer people to be intimate with. <laughs> Cain wanted to please God and gave him an offering, sort of a thoughtless offering, I guess, from the ground that he worked. Maybe some roots or something like that. Abel, representing the higher self, gave the offering to God of his best sheep. Well, God was different in the Old Testament. And uh, God really didn't, didn't like that offering. Uh, he criticized it, a uh, Cain's offering. And so in an angry, jealous rage, Cain killed Abel. That's not good. The firstborn person on earth commits the first murder. Wow. Well, God, of course, is in turn very angry with Cain and, and of course, uh, cursed him. And, and Cain's ego and actions would make him a fugitive on earth. That's, that's what God said as he cursed him. And he would have many struggles in life because of it. Unlike higher nature, which is grounded in quiet being rather than doing. The ego is busy solving and trying to fix problems it has already created in its frenzy. And that's what God had in store, or told Cain that that's what he was in store for. So Cain, cursed by God, migrates to the land of Nod, in the Ubi, Nod, an interesting place. Um, actually, it's not a place, metaphysically, but a consciousness, which means to wander in a sleep-like state, if you look at the etymology of the word Nod. That's where we probably get the expression, uh, not off to sleep. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> Uh, some say that this is a reference to reincarnation as we wander from lifetime to lifetime until we figure out how to release ourselves from the ego and come to understanding with and union with our divine self the land of God Not a really happy place to be. So Cain is wandering and forlorn in this troubled world full of suffering, which he and his followers created. He built cities and invented things and actually built a world of chaos as a result. And the world is sort of still in chaos, still in this land of Nod. So this is the land of Lot, Nod, and I'm going to leave that story there. And the next most hope, more hopeful story, I believe, also refers to this land of Nod and how we can escape from it. And now I'm going to go, I put part one behind part two. Okay. There is another story of brothers in the Bible. These brothers are not named. They, they, they don't have a name, but I think their name is every brother and every sister. But this is another metaphysical story highlighting God's love. And it comes from, I was going to bring it, but I didn't, uh, from Ernest Holmes' interpretation of the prodigal son. And, and this was found in his book, The Science of Mind. And he, of course, was the founder of the Church of Religious Science, our, our sister congregation, which has most of us and probably all of the same beliefs. And there's an interesting parallel to the Cain and Abel story. It shows us there is a reciprocal action between the universal mind, God, and the individual mind, our own. You probably all know the story. It's one of the most story, famous stories in the Bible. It begins with the father having two sons. 
The Father here is a metaphor for God. Meaning, as the Son of God, man has the right of self-choice. Again, similar to Cain and Abel, man has the right of self-choice and the possibility of experiencing good and evil. As levels of consciousness, like in Cain and Abel. Each man, though, in this story, is an individual and can do as he pleases. So the youngest son comes to his father and says, Hey, Dad, give me a, my portion of all the goods you got. I'm ready to go. And God says, Dad, God says, Okay. And gives it to him, just like he asked for it. Wow, I, I, I would have given my son a lot of flack if he... up and smart young son said he's something like that to me. I would have told him he was making a mistake and I'd be very regretful that he did this, he might starve to death, etc, 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 blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and of course my son would hear the blah, blah, blah. Well, there's a difference between me and God. As surprising as that may seem to you. Uh, there's a big difference. Um, so God didn't argue with him at all. He didn't try to dissuade him one bit. God never argues. Never. To argue is to suppose an opposite. And God has no opposite. He is complete and whole. We argue to arrive at a correct conclusion. God is already the correct conclusion. There is no reason to argue. So he didn't say any of that stuff. He didn't say he might suffer or might starve to his son. God gives you what you ask for. The universe gives us what we ask. Experience alone will teach us what is best to have. So the son got what he asked for, no more, no less. A universal horn of plenty from his father he could do with it what he wanted. And this is a quote from the Bible. The younger son gathered it all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. A far country. <coughs> Maybe like not. Ernest Holmes says that uh, we are all in a far country. For it symbolizes the descent of the soul. It is not a place but a state of consciousness which has separated itself from eternal good. So, again, uh, this reminds me of Cain's wandering in the land of Nod, where Cain and the prodigal son are both miserable. What the parable does not go into detail, uh, into details about other than saying he had riotous living. Uh, but we pretty much know what the young son did. I mean, I'm going to gossip. This is what people do. Okay. Um, come on. He's playing around, drinking, visiting the casinos along the shores of Galilee, enjoying the nightlife, and just having a great time. Until, I guess he lost big time at the casinos or something, but he lost everything. He spent all his money. And at the same time, a famine hit the land. He became desperate. And this shows what happens when you're cut off from your father's spirit and are seeming a partners from eternal good. So the younger brother fell upon dark times in his nod consciousness and ended up in the mud with the pigs and his job was feeding them. This was just a 
terrible place for anybody to be, but especially a young Jewish person. And the pigs represented just the most miserable, awful, disgusting being you could be. Why did God allow this to happen? I mean, if he's a good God, why did he, why did he allow this to happen? Well, as Ernest Holmes says, God is God, and man can always do as he pleases. And God cannot enter the pig pen. He cannot. He doesn't know about the pig pen. For the same reason that, that he said nothing when his son asked him for the money. He said, okay, take it. He said nothing then because he doesn't know what's not to know, what's not for God to know which is evil, because God is all perfect, all good, and whole. If he knew evil, there would be some part of God that is evil, and that is impossible. God cannot know evil and despair. He is perfectly good, and yet can, cannot even conceive of any evil form. The Course in Miracles and many other sages and religious traditions teach that evil comes from man, that this world of man is an illusion, a dream world, and dreams are not real. To escape this land of Nod, we all, all we have to do is wake up from the dream. Sometimes we have to get pretty miserable in order to do that waking up. Well, we know what happens. The sun returns. The father sees the sun on the horizon. The sun, the father. The sun sees the father and wonders what kind of reaction he's going to get. And they both run to each other and me. The clear message is here is God turns to us when we turn to him. The son says to the father, I'm sorry, I'm so miserable, I'm a sinner. Oh, please let me back. I'll be, a, I'll be one of your servants. You can degrade me. I just Please let me come back. Well, what does God say to that? Sure. Nothing. He doesn't know sin. He doesn't know about misery or about sorrow. What does he do? He throws a party. Okay. He welcomes his son. He doesn't complain at all about his previous behavior. But, I'm sorry, I, I, feel, I feel sorry for the older guy, the older son. He's sitting there, he's been loyal to his father all these years. I don't know, if I, if I were the older one, I'd complain. And his older son complained bitterly, really bitterly about it. And his father reprimanded him. He says, why are you being so self-righteous and so judgmental? You should welcome him too. <coughs> well, this turns out, as I'm reading about this, uh, to be perhaps the most significant part of the parable in terms of social issues, especially at that time. The scribes and the Pharisees of the Jews, and by the way, Jesus was telling this story to the scribes and Pharisees. When, when he, according to Luke, who, who apparently was there. <laughs> the scribes and Pharisees of the Jews were sticklers 
for the laws of Jewish religion and culture. And they criticized Jesus for associating with sinners who broke the rules. They couldn't stand that without Jesus. And they were quite self-righteous themselves. The oldest son in the story represents the scribes and the Pharisees. They viewed the law as a cold-hearted transaction where God would deem them righteous in exchange for their obedience. They showed no genuine love. The main purpose of this parable was to rebuke this kind of legalism. Our love for people and God should be what motivates our obedience. And God was thrilled whenever a sinner came to him. He came there. He came to meet the sinner, just as the sinner turned his face to God. And this is what how the parable ends. He's talking to the older son, the uh, older son, and he says, "Son, I'm criticizing you, but I am ever. You are ever with me. Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine." And that's what he's saying to you and me today. Thank you. must always be personalized. It's not my way or the highway. It's not a message that's written in stone and interpreted one way. And so we give thanks this morning as this message from Bob touches each one of our hearts in a different way. That we can take this message and integrate it in the way that touches our soul and guides us as we go forward in this day in the following days. And so let us just take a deep breath and release it as we trust our divine wisdom to do that work. There is nothing that we need to do but to simply be open and receptive to that divine guidance. Let's decide here and now, let's choose here in this moment to not try to decipher the message intellectually but to let it go straight to our hearts. Let us do as, as divine beings, as expressions of God, to receive and to allow and to give in return that wonderful flow of the divine 
when we receive something we automatically <coughs> give and vice versa. As we give, we receive. And so what an amazing gift this morning that we have received. Let us continue to open our minds and open our hearts as we go through the rest of the service this morning. All that is here that is offered for our receptivity, knowing that we take what we need and what we want, we leave the rest. And we trust, again, that divine integration. We allow spirit to do that mighty work in our consciousness, in our hearts, in our bodies, knowing and affirming that wholeness that Bob talked about, that God is and that we are created in the image and likeness of God. We are whole, perfect, and complete. So let us silently affirm that, trust that, know that, and then release, release, release it into the perfection of the universe, knowing that all is truly well. 